today we are talking about uh, modeling Lucent phenological development yield quality using Epsom Next Generation. This is the, uh, the workshop w which carried on as we talked uh, two years ago. It didn't feel that long, but it is. So the overall aim of this project is to develop the uh, to develop a Epsom Next Generation Lucent model to simulate growth development and forage quality under different defoliation regime and photomancy classes. So our ninth hypothesis is that uh, growth and development process of three photomancy class grow under different defoliation regime are the same, which can be quantified by the same parameters and functions. So for those of you who never worked with Epsom, um, Epsom is more like a puzzle. Uh, so you fit different modules together, which form you a workable uh, model that you can work on different crops. Um, so the mod modules include climate, soil, and, uh, and different crops, and they have a management file, which allow you to put in different uh, management script that you can uh, put irrigation, fertilizer, and, and all of that. So for Epson Next Generation, um, which used plant model framework, uh, this model includes include, uh, different plant component. Uh, here's a looser example. And as you can see, there's leaf, stem, uh, tap roots. Um, so uh, we can use different functions in, uh, in those organs and make a model which represent uh, Lucerne in a physiological sense. So um, we talked about the, the model then um, for doing any, develop any crop simulation model. The first thing is to collect as much as, as, as many data sets as possible. So here we have four different experiments uh, conducted in Lincoln over the last 20 years. So the first one was to look uh, to look at um, drought tolerance of three different species. And the second experiment was for uh, nine sowing, uh, different sowing dates. The third experiment was carried on from the second ex experiment, first sowing treatment, uh, which had th four different um, defoliation treatment. Uh, so LL represents 40 de 42 days rotation, uh, SS represents 28, uh, 28 days rotation. So the fourth experiment, which uh, uh, I participated and also Jose and Sarah did quite a bit of data collection. So we had the three different defoliation treatment and F three four dominancy uh, cultivars. This is a uh, irrigate. All of the uh, experiment are irrigated um, last more than two years. This one is four years, uh, five years in particular. So I just made a little table that um, uh, represents all the treatment and experiment. So the idea is really simple. If you look at the first one, E1ILL. So E1 is experiment, experiment one. I is irrigated. LL is 42 days cutting treatment. So another example, let's see. Uh, uh, E2, uh, experiment two, I uh, irrigated LL uh, 42 days defoliation treatment, S sowing date eight, two, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so different symbols represent uh, the treatment ID. This will carry out from all the um, presentation or data analysis I will show you know, later. Uh, and so calibration data set is mostly using uh, 42 two days cutting treatment and sometimes 84 days treatment if um, there's different uh, phenological parts need to be covered by 84 days cutting treatment. So uh, also FD5 is using for calibration. So our verification is 
um, testing those functions under different defoliation treatment and also different photomancy cultivars. Cool. So the um, plant physiology process where, where we're interested here is that, um, so the model is represent the interaction between environment management and crop physiology process. So in the environment factor, because we're fully irrigated and uh, applied um, so fertilizer, so we're only looking at temperature, day lens, solar radiation. For management, we have three different cultivars, four dominancy cultivars, uh, which from a ten, a two to 10 cover the bigger range of four dominancy classes. Uh, and so in that, uh, plant population was more controlled by defoliation treatment. Um, 42, uh, 84 days was quite long and uh, 42 days, then 28 days was quite short for a rotation. Um, for different um, plant physiology process, we're looking at phenological development, can be expansion, um, biomass accumulation and partitioning. So which point to yield and the quality. Uh, so today's our, um, the, our first topic today is phenological development. So um, we published uh, the first paper uh, of um, phenological development in European Journal of Agronomy. So I will just show you guys a few key results that we present in this paper. If any of you are interested, you're more than welcome to read it and, and ask questions if you like. Okay, so for modeling phenological development. So the first step for us is to uh, calculate thermal time and base temperature. So, uh, and then we'll look at development stage, um, which include basal buds, flowering. Uh, the, um, the next one is node appearance and also stem height. So, um, the data collection for this um, um, phenological development is more of um, uh, making note of um, 50% data of 50% of buds visible, 50% of uh, flowering, and uh, counting number of nodes, measuring uh, plant heights. Uh, this measurement was uh, was taking uh, was taking yeah uh, once every week so a bit of the thermal time and base temperature uh, we used three different models um, um, and tb was tested from 0 to 10 as one de degree intervals so if you look at the graph um, yeah. So this dash line plus the straight line, that's the fake frame model. The broken state model is mood model and the curve um, is beta function. So TB is tested from zero to 10. So the statistical evaluation for um, base temperature, we use the three different methods. So the first one is x-interceptive method. So here we use the node appearance rate against uh, mean air temperature and they extrapolate that to y equals to zero, uh, which gives you a x-intercept value, um, which we uh, defined as TB base temperature and the least variable, so we are looking for the lowest CV value. Regression coefficient methods, we are looking for the highest p-value. Okay, if we look into our four different experiments, uh, E1 to E4, um, the x-intercept value, which is TB, gives us different values, some of them below zero, um, which doesn't make biological sense. But if we look at um, 
least variable methods, we will see that um, base temperature from zero to five for moon model give you the same um, CV value and the others give a higher CV value. Uh, if we using uh, rigorous, uh, uh, look, if we're looking for a highest P value, then mood model with TB equals one gives the highest P value. So for here, we conclude that um, from this uh, exercise that we will use mood model with the TB equals to one um, as our uh, thermal time calculation function. So if... I was just going to say, and she did that without me forcing her to do it. It actually happened. Yes, yeah, so the moon model was named by Derek. Uh, named by you. <laughs> yeah, by me, maybe. So for three um, defoliation treatment, if you wonder uh, 28 days, how, how long is that? in terms of thermal time. So it's between 200 to 400 and 84 days is uh, 500 to 1100 thermal unit. Okay, cool. Uh, so we move on to development stage. So in Epsom, there's eight different development stage. So the first four is vegetative stage and the, the next, the last four is rip, rip, uh, reproductive phase. So for a regrowth crop, if you cut the crop or reset to stage four, um, but seedling crop can go through the whole eight different stages. So um, what it looks like in the model. So here you have uh, germinating until ripening. So that's the eight different uh, stages. So Cool. Uh, so we are interested um, several time to but visible stage. So if you look at this graph, um, the the top line is the seedling crop and uh, represent the seedling crop, and the bottom line is the regrowth crop. So the difference between seedling crop and and regrowth crop is there a thermal time requirement to um, to go through, which called the juvenile phase. So the general trend of seed, both seedling and regrowth crop is that thermal time requirement decrease as fold period increase, which confirmed that lucerne is a long day plan. Um, but for regrowth crop, um, there's after um, thermal time, uh, after fold period reach 14 hours, thermal time to but visible stage doesn't change. So we, we think um, for around 14 hours is the cr critical for the period for a crop to reach but visible stage. So then from uh, but visible stage to flowering, um, there's a linear relationship between uh, thermal time to flowering against thermal time to but visible stage. And if you look at the equation, so uh, the slope is 0 0.91, which is no different as one. So uh, what this means, t uh, thermal time is the only driving factor. Um, so temperature is the drive driving factor from but visible to flowering. So, so, sorry, Shumei, can, can, yes. can I just ask a question there? Or, um, yep. Was that, uh, all, all the experiments were under ir irrigation or? or yes, uh, solving... all the experiments are under irrigated okay. conditions. And, and so, so would you say, or perhaps that's a question for the end, but would you say that if there weren't any irrigation, would that also be a driving factor? I mean, water would be one or would that still be thermal time? Um, okay, so what I heard of from Derek is that if um, without irrigation, so the canopy heats up, uh, so the temperature accumulation actually gets um, 
faster thermal time accumulation will be um, higher compared to irrigated conditions. So yeah, yeah so temperature still is still be the driving factor of yeah. So it's a often you hear people talking about plants um, going into survival mode when it's drought stressed and therefore they they go to flowering quicker. But if you measure the canopy temperature, if the canopy is photosynthesizing, it's five to eight degrees lower than air, than the air temperature. Um, once the stomata close, it can be five to eight degrees warmer. And so if you then look at mild stress, not severe stress, but mild stress, um, mild water stress actually just changes that rate of development. And so it's really because we're measuring the wrong temperature because we're basing all of this on air temperature instead of the canopy temperature. And the best example I had was probably the first experiment that I ever did when Hamish um, was a student. And it was just outside my office and we had irrigated and dry land lucerne next to each other. And I got up to three weeks difference in the time of flowering, um, simply by the fact that one was irrigated and the other wasn't. And because the soil was so deep, there was no difference in, those, in the flowering time up until February. You know, so the middle of February, the middle of summer for us. And I, that was the first time I saw that phenomenon and it's, it's real. So we then measured canopy temperatures. So there's a thought that, you know, mild water stress is, is causing plants to go reproductive quicker. No, it's not. It's changing the canopy temperature, which is accelerating the development of the plant. Great, right, thank you. You may. Yes. Uh, sorry, yes. just uh, one question. Uh, bus temperature is one, yes, for these numbers? Say again. Say again, please. Uh, the the bus, bus temperature was, was one for these numbers? Yes. For this? Yes. Graph? Okay, for thanks. Yes. So for all of the stuff you do, you've used the moon model? Yeah, so the moon model was used the, through all the analysis. So yes, that's the base temperature we'll choose. Okay, and, and partly, Herman, partly why we end up using one is possibly because our autumns are quite cool. And so we have to pick up that slowing that's occurring okay. towards um, to, okay. that's happening in autumn. So it's really just that last part. You know, five degrees worked pretty well. But it, and if you don't have many temperatures that have an average around sort of six, seven, eight, it's not going to make any difference. But because we do in the autumn, um, we actually okay. have to use that one degree temperature to pick up those differences. Okay. okay. So that's why we end up using that broken stick one rather than a five. Okay, thanks. Okay, cool. Right, from here. Um, cool. So we carry on. So this is what looks like in the model to represent um, thermal time to buds visible stage. So here's um, uh, model evaluation methods that we use. Um, and uh, called nash sakloff model coefficient, uh, efficient coefficient, so uh, which, which is an NSE. So NSE equals to one, that's excellent. So 0 .5, 0 0.5 to one is good, fair is zero to 0.5, and poor is uh, less than zero. So I will use this method through the presentation. and. And so to calling out if the simulation result, uh, the agreement is good or poor or fair or somewhere else. Okay. So our result um, for a uh, simulation of a some uh, days to but visible stage uh, show the overall uh, good ag agreement. Uh, so here's how I arranged our, our simulation result. So, her, so the column, it's FD2, FD5, and FD10. So the rows 
are 40, uh, 84 days cutting, 20, uh, 42 and 28 day cutting. So um, this will give you some idea how how each of the treatment, how it works. Okay, so overall, it's a good agreement for but visible stage. Uh, flowering is the same story, um, and both seedling crop and rigorous crop show the, a good agreement. So we are saying there is no difference between for dormancy uh, cold farce, um, and there is no uh, defoliation treatment effect. Um, to uh, off thermal time to bus visible stage and thermal time to flowering. And I, I'm just, I'll just pick up on that point. Um, it, I'm looking forward to seeing some of the data that comes out of Argentina and, and maybe some that Jorge gets way down in Patagonia because I know we've had a conversation that um, FT2510, there are differences in flowering. But in our situation, when the photo period is the same, because they're all done at the same location, then the driver was temperature. What will be interesting to see is whether that holds when you go to different photo periods. So there may be a photo period by temperature interaction, which we're not picking up at this point. Um, at this point, we're saying under the same photo period conditions, thermal time was the driver of flowering. So you, you may see differences, but I think you really need to have different locations. In the, and what would probably happen in that situation is you might find a difference in when the first flower occurs. So you might have more nodes or fewer nodes to the first flower, um, which would be a photo period response. So that's, that's work that I thought, you know, um, would be an interesting exercise for a long thin country if people were wanting to look at how they behave. But this is a remember this is under the same photo period. Yeah. So conclude from the development stage. Um, so thermal time to but visible um, decreased as photo period increased. Thermal time is the temperature is the only driving factor to but visible from but visible stage to flowering. Uh, defoliation has no effect on lucerne development stage. Uh, three four dormancy level, there's no difference in terms of uh, reaching but visible stage and the flowering stage. So we move on to another important indicator of um, phen phenological development. So um, number of nodes. So number of May stem nodes uh, against thermal time. So here, so S1 is seedling crop, so the first um, through sowing to the first cut. And then the rotation two, three, four, that's the first year. We define that as seedling crop. So uh, of, this, uh, of the seedling crop that we have showed a consistent slope um, of an the, the relationship between nodes, number of nodes to thermal time. If we look at rigorous crop, um, the slope be between and the slope of the linear relationship between node number and thermal time um, was consistent across different years. So let's see, year two, uh, year gross year two, three, four, five. That's the column. If you look at one column. And those slopes are consistent. But if you look at uh, from one row, that's a, a single gross year. So the slope slowly getting um, less than the, the first rotation. So uh, that uh, so this um, inform us that we need to indicate the seasonal changing uh, of uh, the slope. Okay, so we did more investigation in, into um, philochron against photo period. So philochron is the um, thermal time requirement between um, two, uh, thermal time requirement of node intervals. Okay, 
So if we're look, uh, looking at regrowth crop in increasing fold period, it's almost flat. And in decreasing fold period, as you can see, in decreasing fold period, we start with um, fold period at 16, then the decrease to at 10. So fold crop increasing from 35 to 49. And in, in increasing fold period averages about 31. Um, so for seedling crop in increasing fold period, we don't have enough data to say uh, there's any trend. Um, but in decreasing fold period, we can see that seedling crop requires higher um, fold crown, uh, higher, has higher fold crown compared to regrowth crop. So if we represent that into the model, so that's how we modeled in uh, decreasing both period. So I move on to reproductive phase. So um, our non hypothesis is that uh, even plant move to from vegetative to reproductive phase, there's no changing of philochrome. Um, but if we're looking at data set from 84 days cutting treatment, um, we can see, so that's the year, different years and uh, on the column and the, uh, on the row, the column are still different rotation. So different color represent this stage changing. So reaching, so crop, after crop reaching flowering stage uh, indicated by the arrow. And we can see there is a, changing of slope. If we calculate that slope and put in the same way of analysis, um, follow crown against for the period. So in vegetative phase, we still see the same um, 30, 31, 31 um, of follow crown, but in reproductive phase, uh, which is 69, uh, which significantly higher than uh, its same vegetative phase. So sorry, sorry. Can I, mm -hmm. Shumei, Can you go back to the uh, the yeah the yep. previous one, please? Yep. Uh, so what's RT one, RT two, RT three? Um, so that's rotation. rotation one, rotation two, rotation three, rotation four. Twenty four, I call. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I'm wondering why um, when you check like rotation one, for instance, and the second, yep. uh, so on, yeah, so you have the number of main stem nodes. Uh, I assume that that's flowering, right? When, when you it turns pink, I say it pink. Yes. yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's flowering. So you get flowering in the first rotation. Uh, around seven or eight main stem nodes, and then rotation two is about ten or eleven. Um, yeah. So, so you get differences there. Why? Why? Why is that happening there? Why yeah, do you get different times of flowering for different uh, nodes? Good question. Um, so normally rotation one is in the spring, right? And it lasts for three months. Um, the, the majority of them wouldn't flowering. So from August, September, and October, that's the three months. Um, I I'm not sure why this one flowered. Actually, that's the this is the first year. That's the second year of the uh, experiment that we did in uh, Hall's experiment. So, so could there be, a, you, were, you were mentioning that rotation one perhaps is the first one in the spring. Yes. So perhaps if, if rotation two is going more into the uh, autumn or- Yeah, the spring uh, and the, in the summer. So from uh, November, December to January. We normally cut so, off, yeah, around January. So could it be that uh, photo period is declining and therefore you get uh, flowering a bit later in terms of mainstream nodes? Could that be the reason or? So I'm for just... the first one or? Yeah, for, for the rotation too. I mean, 
the rotation so, too. Yeah, rotation yeah. too definitely gets flowering. The majority of the yeah, most of them would get flowering because that's in the summer period when the temperature is high. So the thermal time definitely reached the requirement to, to go to flowering. And yes, plus for the period is getting um, getting shorter. Okay. Right. And if you remember back to our original work, there is a relationship between um, photo period and the thermal time target for flowering. Yeah. So that in the shorter photo periods, you require more thermal time to flower. And therefore that it generally comes out as you require more nodes because the filicron is the same. Yeah, 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 okay. So, so as you get, I think, it, I think the numbers were something like um, 600 thermal units for flowering in um, a 14 hour photo period, dropping down to about 350 thermal units. So the same thing, people often talk about midsummer as the lucerne again going to flower really quickly. But it's it's a combination of you generally have some moisture stress and your shortest photo period. And so right. the thermal time target actually changes as you go progress through the spring, but it then goes back out again as you go into the autumn. So at the same photo period, the target the thermal time target changes. From a management perspective, that was why we stopped saying wait for 10% flowering for grazing because we had to wait till I grew plants that were 70 centimetres tall that weren't flowering. Um, and, and the same thing um, in the autumn, I use that as a management for people and say, let it have one flowering. And I sometimes get people ringing me in April saying, my lucerne hasn't flowered. And I go, it's okay. <laughs> Because I know the thermal time target is blown out so much that it's not going to flower. Exactly. And they're sitting there going, but it hasn't flowered. And I'm like, it'll be okay. It's, it's, exactly. it's had its rest. Whereas if they do that in February, they will see flowering. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of how we've used that flowering in a management perspective. Um, the interesting result here, the one that we can't explain, is that one you pointed out, Jose, year two, rotation one. Um, but the others all follow as we'd expect, that you get fewer nodes required for flowering as you go into um, the longer photo periods. Yeah. All right. Great. So Thank you. If, if I remember right, so we had year two and rotation one here in somewhere here, um, uh, lower than what is uh, the main average of that the majority of the um the reproductive phase uh, full of crown value so i took that as an outlier and didn't include in the set analysis so here's how it modeled uh imp implement into the model uh, so if we look at the simulation results um so 84 Days, which is HH um, for different three different for domestic class. It has really good uh, agreement, so the ASC value is quite high. And uh, F forty two days for different for domestic and and twenty eight, they all showed really good agreement. So conclude from. Uh, philochrome and no, no appearance. So a uh, philochrome for seedling crop doesn't respond to photo period change. Uh, although we don't have enough data to make further more conclusions. Philochrome in vegetative stage decreases, photo period increases. Uh, great photo period, uh, great uh, thermal time was required for no appearance in short photo period condition for rigorous crop. Um, it also happens in seedling crop and the reproductive phase um, of rigorous crop um, requires higher uh, thermal time to reach that visible stage and flowering. And defoliation doesn't affect no uh, follow crop and three fold dormancy has no difference in terms of no no, no appearance and follow crop. Okay. Just before we go off that, Shumei, yes. um, I think the 
point that we were talking about, about how the photo period changes the um, time of the first flower, that's captured in the time to bud visible. Yeah. So if you if you think about the graph that Shuma had earlier, she had um, from bud visible to flowering was constant in thermal time, but there was differences in bud visible based on photo period. Okay, so that's where you're capturing that difference in the spring. And if you go back to that graph that you just yeah. had there, yeah, if you, if you look at that, the short one there, we've got about 600 in the regrowth crop. So that's your highlight that um, it's taking, the target is longer in that early spring period, whereas once we got to about 14 mm -hmm. hours, the target became about the same. So that's where the photo period effect on the number of nodes probably to first flower is captured. All right? So we move on to height. Um, here we develop a, a term called the height cron. So uh, uh, defined as uh, thermal time requirement for one millimeter of stem elongation. So it calculates as um, thermal time accumulation against the plant uh, height. Um, basically, that's the slope of that regression, a linear regression. So our not hypothesis is that um, follow cron uh, height cron doesn't is not affected by photo period changes. So if we look at um, height against the thermal time for the uh, seedling crop, so again S one is seed the first rotation. Uh, RT2, second, um, third, and so on, right? So the slope is consistent, although there's variations. So the reason for that is because um, some of the seedling crop, so because there's a sowing uh, date difference, so uh, rotation two probably is aligned together with a, uh, rotation three for other experiment. So that's why um, the, sl the slope, there's variations in those rotations. But if we um, look at that slope against the full period, which will oh, uh, take, take care of that uh, variation. So, okay, cool. So move on to um, regrowth crop um, again. Uh, the column is the rotation and the rows are the years. So if we look at um, one, one column, you can see the slope are consistent. So uh, across different years. But if you look at a row, let's see the first, uh, the second regrowth years. Um, so the slope decrease as um, across different rotations as the rotation goes from one to six. So we investigate um, height crown against photo period and to to you know, try to understand the, what what is the um, how we could. Um, quantify that response. So for seedling crop, uh, we can see that the high crop was fairly consistent um, for across different fold period. But for regrowth crop, um, 12, no, 12 to 16, it's, it, it's quite, and it's flat. But from 10 to 12, there's a sharp decreasing uh, of um, high crown against photo period. Um, so, uh, which, which means in lower photo period conditions, a uh, plant requires more thermal time to develop one millimeter of, of stem. That stays short. Yeah, yeah. And, and as we can see in the field in the spring, or in uh, in the winter when the temperature is ten hours, uh, when the photo period is ten hours day length, um, the plant doesn't really grow and it stays really short. 
And we don't know what would happen with the seedling crop because no one ever plants a seedling crop in the middle of winter. Yeah. So, you know, that's why we, we don't have any data there to know what a seedling yeah. crop would do. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so that, that would be linked to partitioning, to root partitioning? Uh, yes, probably. Um, we'll come to that because the partitioning in the autumn changed us a wee bit, but not too much. Um, we'll come to that when we deal with the full dormancies. All right. So if we do an inverse of um, hydrochrome, we'll get... Um, millimeter of um, per degree CD. So I call that uh, elongation rate, stem elongation rate. Uh, so if, if we plot that against um, fourth period, it will give you a linear regression, uh, which indicate uh, critical fourth period is about 11 hours. So here's how we uh, implement in the looser model and what it looks like for height, for height chrome. Okay, so if we uh, look at the reproductive phase, so the, um, our non hypothesis is that height chrome is not affected by phenological development stage. So again, the same, um, uh, same graph as we showed um, for node appearance. So R1 is rotation one, R4 is rotation four, and year one to year five. This is 84 days um, cutting treatment. So again, it's similar here for rotation, rotation one and year two. Also, the slope also changed. Um, as we saw in the node, number of node slides. Um, so if, if um, crops start flowering, uh, there's a significant changing in the slope of height against the thermal time. So if we calculate uh, height crawl of those rotations in vegetative stage, uh, we see a very similar um, fit or uh, uh, regression as we had it before. But for rigorous crop, uh, for re reproductive phase, uh, the height crown was uh, significantly higher uh, than the one that's in the vegetative phase. So for FD2 and FD10, um, this is more interesting because um, that claim that FD10 are significantly taller in the autumn than the rest of the full dormancy levels. Uh, what we found is yes, so height crown was lower, which means uh, they require, so FD10 require uh, less thermal time to elongate one millimeter of stem, but FD2 is about the same um, probably slightly, slightly uh, lesser than FD5, but FD10 is... The height crop. Oh, sorry. Height crop. The filicron is the same. Yeah. So it's not that it's producing nodes any quicker, it's that it's elongating Elongate. those nodes more quickly. Mm. So you don't get more nodes, you just get longer stem, so your internode is longer. Yeah. 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 So if we use those functions for FD 5, 10, uh, 5 2, and 10, uh, we can see that uh, 84 days, so HH treatment has good agreement. Um, 42 days had fair agreement. Um, FD 5 is a bit overestimate uh, of the height um, for FD uh, for 28 days, FT5 is overestimate uh, of height uh, of height, and but it, it didn't show in FT2 and FT10. So for for the height uh, crawl, uh, height section, we conclude 
um, there are strong pol polynomial relationship between uh, high chrome and main fold period. A great thermal time was required for uh, semi logation in short fold period condition and also in reproductive phase. Um, model underestimate height for uh, for 20, under 28 days defoliation treatment. Um, this probably because uh, there's nitrogen and carbon restriction in um, in the root system uh, that we will look into when we comes to the third day of our presentation. You may. Yes. Um, if you go back to the graph that you had uh, FD2 and FD10 against photo period. Yeah. Um, do these curves sort of like start to flatten out at the same time? Like, um, is the photo period response the yeah. same for all of them? Because at 12 and 13, you see that that's maybe looks like 13 is the, the key yeah. photo period yeah. here. And and then it's just the rate that changes. And should the rate be more related to like a nerdiness per se effect of each type of plant than actually for the period? Um, what do you mean by rate? So yes, like I the, see the hydrochrome. Yeah, 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 hydrochrome. Yes. So. So yes, yeah, 13 hours for both FD10 and FD2, yes. So after 13 hours- It, it doesn't matter which one you have, yeah. yeah. Yes, but in lower than that, yep. So, so the question, um, Mariana, is earliness. The, the question would be earliness of what? Because- um, So earliness per se would sort of be like, the genetic, um, the gene groups that will control all this rate of development. For example, if you have the emergence being faster for one type of culture than the other, then that's uh, 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 yeah, earliness the per point se. Is, yeah. The point is that we don't. So this is the only function that showed any differences between the full dormancy classes. So. So earliness per se, um, you would think that you would have a change in the timing of the first flower or the rate of node appearance or the rate mm -hmm. of flowering, but none of yeah. those things changed. The only thing that changed was um, the rate at which the stem elongation occurred between the, the cultivars. And so it's difficult to say whether that's been a genetic change you know, what is the genes that's been changed with an FD10? I suspect it's that they've taken out some of their ability to respond to photo period. That mm. the partitioning one that we'll come to on Wednesday um, showed that up. But but you're right. Yeah, it's definitely related to the hours. partitioning. Yeah. yeah, so I think yeah. it's actually a partitioning yeah. thing um, that's driving this rather than a genetic control. But mm -hmm. the genetic control could also be of the partitioning. Yeah, yeah. So if you've taken out that ability of the plant to respond to a decreasing photo period, mm -hmm. while it would continue to grow, it changes um, the partitioning. Yes. And the partitioning's changed. Yeah. yeah. So we think that might be the mechanism. It's a good question. I'm yeah. um, trying to marry the genetics with the, the physiology, but we suspect that the answer here is um, because all those other things don't change, you know, in wheat, it would be you've got a a change in the flowering time or mm -hmm. change in terminal spike lip, but here we've got no changes in bud visible or mm -hmm. any of the other phenology parameters. It was just the height component that changed with the FD2, FD10. Herman, have you got a question? Yes, yes. Uh, the, the mass or the, the weight of per centimeter per millimeter was the same because we are talking about uh, length, but mass, mass per length was the same for cultivars? That's a good question. So what was your individual stem mass the same? Per, per centimeter, mm -hmm. yes. 
I don't know. We're, we will we, check that because yeah. that'll be part of the biomass. So but, we'll, but you need, we'll, yes, but you need link. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I'm trying to think whether we, I think we had um, more mass, but mass divided by height to give us um, grams per millimeter is really what you're talking about. Yeah. You've just yes. given Shumei something to do overnight. She'll answer that one tomorrow or maybe maybe Wednesday. For us, Wednesday. Okay? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Have we finished? I think so. Um, oops. Yeah, so so that actually is the end of the, the presentation. I see it's right on an hour from when we started. So I'm happy to take whatever other questions you might have, but hopefully that's given you a feel for the work and a catch up. Really, that was a, um, some of that we'd seen before in the workshop. And so it's really just now, I think, uh, much clearer in Shumei's mind, in my mind, as to how the, the full dormancy um, is affecting things. And that the short, short is probably affecting biomass which is then affecting um, height and we'll come to that later but that's pretty much it so if there are other questions about the presentation I will take them now or I'll, otherwise I'll say we'll see you tomorrow was, was there <clears throat> was there any winter damage to uh, within the fall dormancy 10? Um, we probably don't get cold enough for frost type winter damage, David, but what we got was um, a huge decrease in plant population over the five year period. So some of that result um, will come up later and um, Sarah's actually done a lot of work on the weed content of those plots. So we definitely got a huge change in the plant population out of those FD10s compared with the FD2. The FD2s at the end of five years, you'd have looked at the stand and said it can go another five years. The FD10s, they were gone. And I, I mean, I think that's anecdotally what all of us would would see with you know believe but i don't think it's from winter damage from frost that you might you know you get frozen ground in in um, a lot of continental us but we don't get that here so ours is more a lack of the ability of the plant to keep keep its canopy closed and therefore you get weed ingress rather than it being damaged so um, the plants are essentially growing themselves to death more quickly in the FD10 I think we'll pick up a little we have this tension between fall dormancy and winter survival mm -hmm. or potential of yield versus the stand population or winter damage and so what is your typical management recommendation is it a fd5 for us it's an fd5 um from a yield perspective from that balance between yield and um stand persistence our growers would be looking for six to seven years as a minimum and we can do that out of an fd5 we can't do that out of an fd10 and an FD2, um, we could probably we probably have never brought them in. So the you know the one we picked up here was a line that was introduced that we managed to get hold of, but it's they're not commonly used in New Zealand. And our our experience with it was that it was almost as productive as the FD5. You know, its yeah. yield was about the same, but its persistence was greater. So it was hanging in there a lot better. And, and um, I think on Wednesday when we do the um, the biomass one, we'll give you a really good feel for the physiology of the differences between those that that Shumei's worked out. Why they why they do those different things and look different. That's probably been the um, the bit that she's had to work the hardest on. But she's got a really nice relationship for why they behave so differently. But I guess today was about saying. That for most things they, ha they didn't really behave that differently the only thing they really exactly. behaved differently in was height mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So is your management recommendation for harvest schedule, you mentioned that 28 was very short, but for, for our systems, we will often go shorter than 28 days uh, for high quality dairy. Okay, wait, yes, we'll talk. Okay. Yeah, so that's a good um, comment. And that's why I got Shumay to include um, the thermal time values here because you know talking 28 days is is not sensible when i'm talking to guys from argentina that have 40 degree days in the middle of summer so for us um most of the 28s were closer to the 200 to 250 occasionally it got a bit longer our normal recommendation would be somewhere around 350 to you know 350 to 400 thermal units um and so that if you think about a filicron of just roughly a filicron of around 35, 350 thermal units is about 10 nodes. Mm -hmm. And that's, for us, that was often, we, we manage for grazing, we aim for about a 30 centimeter height. For cutting, we're probably looking at 45, 40 to 45. And that would come from that, from our 42 day rotation, which is, um, you know, in your case, much too long. So I think that's why we need to get to talking about rotation length in terms of thermal time accumulation rather than um, actual days. Yeah. Got it. Uh, uh, Herman, what, what was your gra grazing treatments? If I remember you were sort of 350 and 550 or something, wasn't it? Yes, uh, but um, based in historical data, in true, uh, we are more variable, yes, because, uh, yes, the setup, the experimental setup was, we tried to do 350 and um, 500, but okay. then when the experiment was, was running, uh, this changes a little bit, yeah. So I think that's why we've got the ranges, you know, 28 days was not always 28 days either. It, yes. <laughs> sometimes there's no stock or there's no people or, yeah. So we understand that. But in general, um, your 350 was sort of about your, that would have been slightly shorter than normal and the 550 would have been the normal rotation. Uh, for us, we would say a 550 is a long rotation that, you know, the plants are getting quite stemmy and quite, the quality part's gone. Um, so I would think from a cutting one, we'd be about 450, David, would be my best guess. Yes. Okay. Well, now, uh, yes, because our climate is warm. Now we are doing experiments. Uh, 14 days, um, seven plus seven, no more longer that, than that. Uh, and this, we are doing, we are, sorry for my English, we are getting very, very good results mm -hmm. uh, against in spring, in spring and summer. Then we have a rest in, in autumn, but uh, very good results, yes. Uh, I look forward very to short, hearing about very those. Short. Yes. I, I, don't, I don't know the, thermal time of, of, of those, but I, I will you, calculate, of course. You can yeah. calculate. And the other thing is for us, for my farmers, I've been telling them 30 centimeters. Yeah. That, from, you know, that to me is the trade-off is, you know, graze at about 30 centimeters. And that's the trade-off between quality and quantity from a grazing perspective. And that's why I said with the height, David, we, we would say 40 to 45, simply because you need about 10 centimetres of firm um, stem to actually get your cutter bar through and get the things to be long enough to make hay or silage, you know, bale them up. So they have to be 40 to 45 centimetres. But the, the taller you go, the more, um, and we'll come, I think we're dealing with that as we go into the quality one later on on Thursday, we'll pick up there. Look, I'm going to stop things there because I know um, some of you, it's a Sunday and I, I appreciate you having joined us. Um, and we'll pick up again tomorrow. And as I said, tomorrow we'll look at the canopy development and um, Edmar will give us a little bit of, of the modeling that he's been doing. So um, it's great to see familiar faces. And um, I hope you've, that that's sort of some of it's resonated with what you've been doing or seeing. And it gives you a framework to potentially think about how you can do your analysis of your 
experiments at the same time. Um, give you something to work off. And um, we'll see you tomorrow.